I never publicly talked about why I was doing a, a personal holding company. And you basically sniffed it out of me and tweeted about it publicly. And then people are like, oh my God, this makes a lot of sense. Personal holding company is basically when you take yourself and you say, I want to productize myself. And I want to have a lot of bets in a particular thesis, not one bet, not you're going to start a, a company, you're going to raise venture for it, and you're going to spend the next 10 years of your life doing it. No, you're going to focus on the thesis and have multiple bets and own pieces of those businesses. Some of those pieces might be minority. Some of those pieces might be majority. Some of those pieces might be 100%. But the idea is that you're a thesis-driven holding company that holds businesses not necessarily designed to sell those businesses. You can easily cash flow those businesses as well. It always comes back to productizing yourself and based on the thesis. Welcome to Media Empires, where we sit down with the most influential media creators right now to learn exactly how they built their empires. Our aim is to extract the secrets of top tier podcasters, newsletter authors, and media creators who are breaking the old rules for media success. Whether you're looking to start your own empire, or simply curious about the nuts and bolts behind media businesses, you'll find valuable insights and tactics in each episode. Grab your headphones, let's dive in. Riverside is a presenting sponsor of Media Empires. It's an essential part of our tech stack. Riverside makes scaling a media business possible for us and so many podcasters and creators. It's our online recording studio, not just for the show, but across the entire podcast network. Riverside lets us record interviews with the best guests from wherever they are in the world. Our team can also cut short form clips directly from Riverside. Because as any listener of this show knows, you create once and then publish everywhere. Sign up for Riverside.fm today by following the link in the description box and use our code Media Empires to get a 20% discount. Greg Eisenberg is the co-founder of Late Checkout. He previously spent many years as a startup founder and executive building companies like Islands, which sold to WeWork, uh, as well as working at companies like StumbleUpon. Today's conversation is a masterclass on personal holding companies, community-first content, and building service businesses, contrary to what many in Silicon Valley may opt to do. Greg is pioneering the category, and I'm lucky to have spent some time with him, grilling him on what he does. Without further ado, here's Greg. So Greg, you've spent the last 15 years building venture-backed businesses. You started venture-backed businesses, Five by Islands and others, you've sold them. You've uh, gone and worked at big venture businesses. You know, we work, uh, you know, a stumble upon, you advise TikTok and a bunch of others. Um, but recently, in the last couple of years, you decided to do something a bit different. You decided to build uh, an agency, a studio, uh, a personal holding company that does, uh, that does a few different things. So maybe let's start there. Why, why don't you define, because you, you've helped, I think, introduce this term, what is a personal holding company and what inspired you to, to, to make the change and, and build something different? So a personal holding company is when you productize yourself. And you actually, I don't know if you remember this, Eric, but you actually tweeted this about me. Yes. I don't know, two years ago? Yep, me more Greg Eisenberg. Yeah, basically you, because I, I never publicly talked about why I was doing a, a personal holding company, and I'll explain what that is in a second. And you basically sniffed it out of me and tweeted about it publicly. And then people are like, oh my God, this makes a lot of sense. What I was trying to do, well, first of all, let me, let's define what is a personal holding company. Personal holding company is basically when you take yourself and you say, I want to productize myself and I want to have a lot of bets in a particular thesis, not one bet, not you're going to start a, a a company, you're going to raise venture for it, and you're going to spend the next 10 years of your life doing it. No, you're going to focus on the thesis and have multiple bets and own pieces of those businesses. Some of those pieces might be minority. Some of those pieces might be majority. Some of those pieces might be 100%. But the idea is that you're a thesis-driven holding company that holds businesses, not necessarily designed to sell those businesses. Uh, like you can easily cash flow those businesses as well. Um, but it always comes back to productizing yourself and based on the thesis. Yeah, I, I found the tweet and it's uh, Greg Eisenberg for X. And it, it's a quote tweet of your, your announcing your studio. And in my tweet, it says, Greg Eisenberg for X, become an expert in a specific sector or niche, write and podcast about the space, build products and tools or otherwise operate in the space to stay sharp and current and invest. That's it, man. Like, that's it. And I think... Um, 
one of the reasons why I started it was because I was a part of WeWork, which is the greatest example of how venture capital can go wrong. What what happens when you when you write someone a check for uh, you know was it eight or ten billion dollars and and how that affects employees, investors, customers? You know, it was the greatest example of growth at all costs that I can think of in, in recent memory. To say I was turned off of venture capital is an understatement after that experience. It's so ironic that I have a number of friends who, and I, I felt this way too in the past, like, or, or even in the present, who have raised so much, it's like the people who've raised so much money don't want to raise venture capital for the next thing. Right. Well, it's like, you know, if you're, if you're dating a, a blonde girl, you might want a brunette the next time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, it, it, it's funny because of the, you know, and, and if you're just starting out in your career, you, you, you might need it. But um, if, if you have the luxury of not being able to, and, and today is just so much easier to get products off the ground. I'm preaching to the, to the choir here uh, or to the, to the conductor even, um, you know, it, it, you, you could do so much before needing to raise venture capital and you just to get to own your own destiny. But what you did, something that's really interesting is you started a agency, a, a cash flow business. And this is part of the PHC idea that you, that you fund it with one of your, uh, with a cash flow business that allows you to, you know, either acquire companies or make investments in companies or, or incubate your own. Yeah. So I started with a product design agency and it's because as a teenager, I was a partner in a design agency. So it was something I understood really well. And yeah, so I started with the design agency and we started, you know, getting one client, two clients, three clients. Before we know it, we had a really big business and we grew it, you know, we were about 40 people or so uh, all in the agency. And it is really important to focus on a cash flowing entity from, from day one. And, and granted an agency, like the margins, they're not great. It isn't a SaaS business, but it is something that could a bring a bunch of really smart people together, which has, you know, they're, they're gaining insights every single day. And then B you are getting some amount of cash flow that you can reinvest. I do want to speak to a point that you said, where you kind of alluded to, which is like, do you need to be a serial entrepreneur or a well-known VC or someone with an audience in order to start a PhD. Meaning, do you need to like be established to start a PhD? And I actually think that the answer is no, you do not. I think that because to your point, like it's now cheaper than ever to create products. Now there's so many resources out there and how to grow audiences. I, I know 18 year old, you know, kids literally starting PhDs right now. How are they doing it? Like, what 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 are the types of cash flow opportunities available to people who don't have audiences or expertise? Well, the first is, I mean, I was an advisor to TikTok, and you, you, I know you spent some time on TikTok. Like, these eighteen year old kids know TikTok better than you and I combined. Right. Exactly. So it's like, okay, step one: How do you create a TikTok show that gets a lot of interest and aggregates audience? Step two is: How do I take that audience? convert them into a community, get their email addresses, get their phone numbers, nurture them into being advocates. And then step three is really like, okay, now what can I build them? I think that if you're young and you're just, you know, starting out, the best thing that you can do is think about where is your unfair advantage in terms of audience building and then start building that audience as quick as possible. And so let's give more examples than, than the tech talk one. So yeah, if you have a domain expertise like like you do in community or you know some influencers do around their their category, you know it's a bit more straightforward. If you don't have a clear domain expertise and you're let's just say not on TikTok or, or not like deep enough to be an advisor on it, what are other areas that come to mind that could be like a good foundation for a PhD? I actually step one is really pick a niche and then stop and then go even nicher because you're starting to see people who have niches right now and they're not seeing traction. And if they only went one level deeper that, that, you know, it would have worked. So for example, like, you know, they want to do the niches, luxury watches, like that's too broad now. Whereas five years ago, that would have been niche. Now you might have to pick like Rolexes from the 1980s and just only talk about that. So I'd say step one is to go incredibly niche. 
Step two is to look at what platform do I think has the highest likelihood of me going viral in that niche. So it's a mix of where do those people live? So in the example of the 80s Rolex people, maybe that's LinkedIn. And I actually think that TikTok, LinkedIn, and Twitter are the three best paces in order to you know, go viral to get audience uh, right now. And thinking about like, okay, I'm going to go on LinkedIn. I'm going to go tell stories about 80s luxury watches. I'm going to go aggregate demand. And that's really, that's, that's the only two steps you really need to be thinking about in the beginning. Let, let, let's go pull that thread a little bit in terms of it's 2023. What are you know, the best ways to, to, to build an audience? You just mentioned three platforms that you think are ripe for, for audience building. Why do you think those, those platforms are ripe right, right, right now? And maybe talk a little bit more like what's different about 2023 in terms of, in terms of audience building that may have been different a few years ago? Well, what's different, to start with that, what's different is that short form is everywhere and the internet is more like TV than anything. Like it used to be the internet felt like a newspaper. Today, the internet feels like television. It feels like television because what we saw in 2022 was, and a bit of 2021 is all the major platforms added a video component to their products, short form video. What does that mean for creators? Well, it means that you should probably be creating short form video content and distributing that. And I think the unfair advantage that a lot of people have is that there's probably a ton of niches that there isn't short form video content. So for example, like in the eighties Rolex space, like, I don't know, are people creating, you know, short form video there? I'm not sure. So that's to answer your second question to answer your first question, which is why do I think that TikTok, LinkedIn, and Twitter are the best places in order to start and grow an audience? I think it's just because those platforms are centered around basically 15 minutes of fame. So like when you go on TikTok, of course, it's centered around the For You page. So your whole goal as a creator is to get on people's For You page, which is essentially, to use an analogy, it's like the front page of the New York Times. Like your goal is to get on the front page of the New York Times. Whereas, you know, when you go on Instagram, like most of the content on your feed is still via your friends. So like I follow Eric Tornberg, I follow Ben Kasnoka, like these are my friends, I see them and I'll, that's where I go to consume a lot of that content. So you want to focus on platforms that are designed to get you 15 minutes of fame. Why? Because you're looking for fame. That is the reason why you're a creator. The re you know, a, a main reason. If you want to build an audience quickly, you want to attract fame. And what I mean, when I, what I mean by fame is really like micro fame. You want the ability to just amass some few thousand people. So that's TikTok. Twitter, I don't know if you've seen recently, but... You know, I looked at the five tweets this morning on my personal Twitter timeline, three out of the five, the first three were, you might like this. Hmm. Yeah. That, is, that, that is a fundamental change in how Twitter is designed. We talked about, I think before we were recording about how you tweeted something in 2016, it got 15 likes. Then you tweeted something the other day, it gets 6,000 likes. What's the difference? The difference is it's optimized for fame. Um, that is a fundamental change. And whenever some social platform, a large social platform makes a, a fundamental change as a creator, you need to pay attention because those are opportunities for you to get more fame. That's number two. That's Twitter. LinkedIn, LinkedIn is old faithful. You know, it, <laughs> it, it is, it, it was the sleeper in 2021 and 2022, I think people now, thanks to people like Justin Welsh, who's a big time LinkedIn creator and others are seeing, are, you know, have preached how, how just easy it is to create content, write stories on LinkedIn and get anywhere between four to 50,000 impressions, even if you have a very small audience. You know, those are the reasons why I generally think about those three platforms right now in 2023. And my next decision becomes, okay, I'm focusing on this niche. Where do these people live? Do they live on LinkedIn? Do they live on Twitter? Do they live on TikTok? And then my next question following to that is, well, how saturated is that platform? So for example, 
you know, crypto. Maybe I, let's say I, I want to, you know, I'm picking the niche of free NFTs. And that's everywhere on Twitter already. It's like pretty saturated. Um, so I might go to TikTok because it might not be where the entire, you know, freedom and NFT community lives, but enough of them are there and it's not saturated with my type of content. The other day we were chatting and you mentioned don't sleep on Insta as well, at least for, uh, you know, you had an episode, a great episode with Natalie Ellis, who, who built a really strong community at Insta and was able to transfer it to her own business. Is that kind of the exception that, that proves to the rule? How do you think about that? I think Insta is a fantastic platform and a really good way to monetize, but I, I don't think it's easy to gain audience on it. So I think it's remarkably hard to be unknown, create a new account and get to a hundred thousand followers within six months. Um, I think it's relative, you know, it's possible with the other platforms I mentioned. So the hack is this, if you want to get a hundred thousand followers in six months on Instagram, let's say get a million followers on TikTok. There's dozens of people who get a million plus followers on TikTok every single month. So it's, it's doable. And what TikTok has is you can actually put an Instagram button on your profile. So they make it really easy for people to find out about you. And then you click the Instagram and that's how you're going to get followers. Once you have those followers, that's when you can nurture them and you can nurture them to communities. You can nurture them to products that you're selling, but yeah, I believe TikTok is the best way to get Instagram followers. Yeah. And we haven't talked about uh, email and also YouTube. Well, one is, is email the holy grail? Or are all these other platforms just a way to get e emails? How do you think about the worth of different audiences or the funnel? I don't know about you, but if we've learned anything from this whole Elon situation is like, they could just change the algorithm, decide to, okay, today they're focusing on optimizing for fame. Like tomorrow they could decide not to and that could just completely alienate your audience right all this work that you put in all of a sudden goes to zero so i think most of the major creators i speak to are really focused on ultimately just getting people's email addresses and getting their email addresses and then putting them into a routine of i'm going to open up your email that's like the game let's close the loop on on phds a bit so we talked about why they're so valuable because you control your destiny, um, you know you can build whatever you want, non constrained by the by the venture model, and, and self fund it. We talked about some ways to to build the cash flow, get it off the ground, whether you're an expert or you're not. Let's go a little bit deeper. Let's say you were running like a a Y combinator for PHCs. Let's say it was like some people who had audience or had potential to to get an audience, so they were going to figure that part out. Once you have the the audience and a bit of the cash flow part. What advice would you be giving to some of these or what framework, what's the build things that people want or do things that don't scale, you know, kind of phrases that you might share with some of the creators? What, what comes to mind? I had a, someone reach out to me this morning. He has 1.5 million followers. He's in the tech space and he reached out to me and he was like, I want to start a PhD. How do I do it? Basically. And his second question was like, what type of products do I build? Like, I just don't know. And my question to him is like, tell me about your audience. Like who, what, what motivates them? That was my first question. What motivates your audience? And he started telling me, well, a lot of them, uh, a lot of them want to go viral. A lot of them are interested in luxury goods. That's when I started telling him like, okay, step number one for you is thinking about how do you take your audience and then basically looking at it, all the different sub niches, like basically map out your audience into the different sub niches and niches that exist. Then when you have that, write out what do you think their motivations are? For example, maybe some of them want to be creators and their motivation is to get uh, fame. Like maybe that's one of the reasons why they watch this person's YouTube channel. Once you've mapped out all the niches and sub niches and their motivation, that's like a great framework for thinking about, okay, I've got this. Now I need to go and validate some of these things because what this creator might think might not necessarily be true. And that's when I generally spend time in places like Reddit or Discord servers, et cetera, where I can go and like teleport to these subreddits essentially 
and validate, you know, in this subreddit, maybe people are talking about um, similar pain points and I can go and validate that. Then my next step then becomes like, there's obviously a hundred different products that I can go and build in this sub niche. How do, how do I prioritize the ones that are most valuable? And that, and then are easiest to launch. So that's I generally a process that I apply as well. So one thing I would say is just like develop that mapping piece uh, is really important when you're thinking about a studio and you're trying to launch products. The, the other thing is to think about, I'm actually more of a believer in buying your first cash flowing business than actually starting it. I have some friends slash people I know who have tried to start agencies, who've tried to start these other businesses and have actually, they end up spending one, two, three, four years trying to kickstart that cash flowing engine while, you know, it did work for us. It's difficult in general. So I would actually recommend figuring out how to buy something that's already working. That's fascinating. What would you advise for, for me, given you, you know me and my interests and my skills does it have to be something that relates to me or is it like, should I buy a design shop or dev shop? What advice would you give to me in terms of what, what I should buy? Yeah. When I think of you, what you're good at, one common denominator with you, and I think people listening should ask themselves that question, what is my common denominator? Your common denominator has always been media. You were doing podcasting way before anyone was doing podcasting in our space. Like now we take this format for an interview that we just think that everyone should do it. But like, you kind of like popularize a lot of this with a lot of your podcasts. So I think what service business could you buy that services creators is an interesting one because you understand creators. I think there's another one where is there a media business that you can buy? Yeah. And I think what's cool about both service businesses and media companies is that they trade for like you know, relatively low multiples, what we're used to in the Silicon Valley tech world. So you can buy one. And I would recommend to you start something small. Another mistake a lot of people make is like, they'll go and buy, spend eight figures or whatever on a business, and it will be just too much to manage. Like go and find something small that you can buy, that you can grow. Andrew Wilkinson from Tiny once told me this uh, on the phone. I remember he's like, why do you always incubate businesses? It's so much harder to incubate than to buy businesses. And he's absolutely correct. So yeah, I would say if you can buy a media email newsletter business, a podcasting business, an agency that services creators, those are interesting ones for you. Yeah, it's interesting. The other question I would have is like, I mean, a successful you know, thing would be you, you buy the, the property, you also buy the team and you sufficiently incentivize the team to just like any acquisition, you know, to, to keep going. And is it really, you're just buying like a portion of it, but it's still like they own a majority. How do you think about that? Yeah, I think, uh, it depends the team and it depends the structure. Well, first of all, I should say that people are writing the rules to this right now. There are some deals that I've seen that it's like, okay, yeah, we'll buy 25% of the business and it's almost like an investment. Um, and it's more passive. Some deals I've seen that are like, we'll buy 50% of the business. But over the next five years, we want to own 100 and here's how we do it or, or 80 or, or 70, right? You'd be surprised how open a lot of these founders are to deals where they, especially during now where the economy is so rocky, where you can come in and be like, hey, I can help scale your business. I'm going to invest in it and you're going to get some liquidity event day one and on day 365, you're going to get this amount. On year two, you're going to get this amount. And, you know, it's sort of a win-win. They get to take a little, a few chips off the table. You get a business that's cash flowing. And then in this scenario, like you're Eric Torenberg, you've got a Twitter following, right? You can post about them and that might grow their business, for example. So they're getting tools that they wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah. That's fascinating. It makes a lot of sense. You know, we, we've discussed services businesses. Given that you're the community guy, I was like, hey, could you see yourself building a platform that could be like the dominant community leading platform? And you're like, well, perhaps. But I'm, I'm really interested in like these services businesses. I was curious because that, that's going back to our original conversation. That's like 
not what Silicon Valley or Silicon Valley mindset is usually focused on because some of the reasons even you mentioned about the margins, you know, and scale and scope, et cetera. I understand having one service business to be the cash flow generating, but wh- why have you been interested in perhaps multiple? Maybe talk about some of the pros and cons there or what excites you. First of all, I think from a revenue standpoint, we've been able to build a lot of revenue with our business and our design agency. You know, 90% of our business is recurring revenue. It's people coming back to us because they like our work, which is awesome. And I'm also just surprised, basically, that we're competing against like really old, old guard, you know, shops that Madison Avenue shops, mostly that have been around for a long time. And I think that there's just opportunity for like new blood and, and there's just opportunity for new, new people to take an, you know, an approach to building different types of agencies. And that's what we've been focused on. You know, I think that the opportunity for building the McKinsey for community itself is a nine figure a year business. So it's kind of hard for me to be like, hey, let's let me go like, you know, this you were you were my first investor for islands. And and it was your first angel, one of your yes. first angel investments. Yes, no, it was my first. Yeah. And you know how difficult it is to build social networking technology. And, and although I, I'd love to build social apps, and I think that from a cash flow perspective, agencies, services, business, there's, there's, you know, easier opportunities there, especially when you're working with, let's say Procter and Gamble, and we're already building a lot of their new products, digital products, going to them and saying like, Hey, now we've got this ad agency that we just bought and selling them ads. Like they're like, Oh yeah, let's do that. To summarize, I think people miss, uh, they don't value services business enough and they romanticize social networking and technology businesses. And you wrote this piece a few years ago. Uh, you wrote a couple of pieces about unbundling of Reddit. And it is you know, fascinating thesis. I think, I think it would be just as impactful as the unbundling Craigslist um, post. We're, we're a couple of years into it uh, or after your, after your piece entering 2023 here. What have you... What have we learned since since you wrote that? Like, have you seen a number of experiments? What have we learned from those experiments? And and where in that thesis are you? Ex- like, where are you still excited, or what's a request for startups? You know, it, it, relative to that in twenty twenty three. I mean, I wrote this piece basically. Uh, you know, I'll summarize it a bit. It was basically this idea that what is Reddit? Reddit is hundreds of thousands of subreddits, which are these communities of people that are like minded in in some way. And you can go to the subreddits, see their pain points, see what they're talking about, understand them, and basically build businesses for them. And when I wrote that piece, to me, it it seemed like it was super obvious. Um, But a lot of people are like, wow, I've never seen the world like that. And I've had hundreds of people reach out to me, if not more than a thousand reach out to me and be like, Hey, I found this subreddit because of your post. And I built this business on top of it. In my initial post, I talked about the idea that discord, which is valued at 10 plus billion is a great example of an unbundling of Reddit. It started off as a tool that they built for the league of legends subreddit. People were kind of like, Oh, I wish there was like a voice tool that like, had chat with it that I could use that was free. They ended up building it. And then they eventually expanded it from League of Legends to most of esports games. And then they expanded that to just like, I think if you go to their website today, the brand is like a a place for everyone. It's a great example that if you start niche, it doesn't mean that you can't go horizontal. It works. Like it, it literally works is one thing we learned is that billion dollar companies were formed on the basis of this thesis, you know, looking forward and almost more interesting, I think like it's going to work, meaning like it's this, it's probably one of the most, it's probably the easiest ways to learn about a particular audience and valid and basically build something at, for them. Um, and that there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity to go and look at using tools. Like I use redditlist.com, which is a tool that basically looks at what are different subreddits that are growing and 
looking at them and be like, you know, in the last 24 hours, this non-alcoholic beer subreddit has grown to from 1,000 to 100,000. What is happening here? And what subreddit searching does, it puts you in the position to ask yourself these questions. Hey, what is happening here? Why is this happening? Oh, if, if I built something like this, what would happen here? So you, you start asking these questions, you end up coming up with answers, lots of opportunity. Yes, yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, the fact that I can't name the Discord for sports, the Discord for finance, and I'm sure there are lots of things, and, and you mean like going way more niche than this, but I'm just saying like the fact that I can't name you know, the, the biggest companies in these spaces, it just shows how early, you know, we are. Absolutely. We just finished working at our agency. We did our brand design sprint with a company called After Hour. That's a pre-launch startup. So I don't think there's much information on them, but basically it's the moderator from Wall Street Bets. Awesome. And yeah, so he obviously understands that community and he's thinking about how do I build like a quote unquote degen app for these people? Another interesting thing is like, forget being an entrepreneur in residence, become a moderator for a subreddit. That's really good. That's a good line. Go join, you know, a, a, a passionate subreddit, become a moderator or create a subreddit and become the moderator. And that's the best way you're going to learn all their lingo, all their systems, what they love, what they hate. Um, and that's the reason why, you know, a lot of people like you and me, we become entrepreneurs and residents. Like we become entrepreneurs and residents because we're trying to learn about different spaces. But I feel like that's so old school. No, that, and it, it goes to this, you know, you, you helped coin it or, or coined it, the sort of community first startup. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, build your product first, th then build your community. And now it's just easier to build a community first. There's a lot to like there because you get to really understand what your community needs, which can inform your product, but then also have your early customers baked in, which helps you recruit, raise money if you need to, et cetera. Now, and, and I've, we've done a bunch of that, both of us, you know, in different ways. What I found challenging, you know, I, I feel like COVID gave a, a little bit of a bump to, to community first businesses and not to say that they're, they're not still tremendously valuable and a good thing to do. But I think some people took for granted that the community would stay and, you know, there needs to be some real value built on top of the community in order for it to be durable and, or, and the community needs to remain curated. One challenge and one question that I've dealt with and also advise others is like, how do you make sure your community doesn't have ne negative network effects? And in fact, how do you make sure it has positive network effects? Whereas, and, and you've talked about the difference in community and audience, but like some people with content first businesses, like we were talking to Lenny Richiski, like communities built around his content and yeah, he, he supports it, but all he has to do is keep coming out with bangers, you know, week after week, which is no easy feat, but there's something about that that's a bit more scalable. And so I've been interested in content first, putting community on top versus community first, putting content on top, that's still different than like product first. But I'm curious how you think about what, what I'm putting out here. When you think about community, let's, let's use product terms. You mentioned Lenny, so I'm thinking, okay, product wise. When you think about community, if you boil down to the product metrics, if you do community right, you get retention right and you get engagement right. So you get retention because people feel more connected to the product because there's other people who they identify with. So retention goes up and engagement goes up because people are using the product more and more because you basically baked in these rituals. So if you do community, right, you do rituals, right? For example, like there's rituals with Lenny's community around these meetups that he's doing. And my hunch is that if you go to these meetups, you're probably more likely to participate in the Slack that he has. You're more likely to potentially read his new newsletters. You're more likely to potentially refer Lenny's, you know, whole product offering and ecosystem to a friend. So community basically takes your product metrics, specifically retention and engagement and puts it into overdrive. So yeah, if you're going to go and create a content business, like who's done that really well, I think like the hustle's done that really well with their trends community. So they had the hustle, which is content. And then they had trends, which is retention and engagement. And they were able to charge for that and build a big business around it. There's lots of examples like that. And I think that what it, what's beautiful about it is it's just going to make your core business, in this case, content more effective. Totally. 
one thing that's interesting is, um, you know, there, there was a lot of community and content businesses over the past, you know, five to seven years that raised venture money. Some of them did well, but a lot of them did well, but didn't do venture scale well. And that's why we've been talking about things like PHCs, because you don't necessarily need to, it's not necessarily aligned with you to raise venture in a way that would take a certain outcome off the table, like selling for $30 million would be life-changing for someone, but for, for venture capitalists, you know, doesn't move the needle and you want to be aligned with your shareholders. So venture isn't necessarily the best path for all, all communities or, or content businesses or even commerce businesses, but I'm curious about if there's other funding models. You guys are still investing. I've been curious about funding models for creators or even indie entrepreneurs, where if there's just less upside, maybe you invest at just a lower valuation. It doesn't make sense for people who are already making cash flow and have de-risked it, but for people who are thinking about leaving their job to go full-time on a creator, let's take, you know, maybe maybe even Lenny was too senior back then, but let's take Lenny when he was at Airbnb and he'd never written a post and he's just like, hey, I've got this idea. Maybe I'd be a successful writer. Could you imagine someone investing in him at like a 1 million valuation or, or a bit smaller? Is there any way to get venture-like returns on the investor side for investing in indie makers or creators in a way that makes sense for both parties. Because if it does, that is almost a new asset class and, and more capital can flow this way. W what do you think about that? Slow Ventures is actually doing this. So have you heard about this? Yes, I'm close to Sam and I spoke to, to Megan. And yeah, it's, it's fascinating. They're going with, with big YouTubers. They'll give them like a million dollars or something at a 10 or 15 or 20 million valuation. I, I think they're trying to get like 5% of their earnings over the next 30 years. So there's basically two, two flavors of their investments. So the first is direct, directly backing creators with equity capital into what becomes their PhD. And then the second thing is backing multi-time entrepreneurs by investing into an incubator slash studio type structure. So they're thinking about this and they're the first ones that I've seen that have really, they're like traditional Silicon Valley as far as I'm concerned. And then they're like, okay, hey, there's this whole new class called creators. How do we structure, how do we get upside? Like, well, that would have been the dream for them if they could, uh, you know, I remember Lenny two years ago, two and a half years ago, had five or 10,000 followers on Twitter, but, you know, one of the brightest guys, like, of course he was going to go and build something successful. I like what's happening with the slow model. Knight Ventures and, and Knight Media is doing something interesting. Are you, fam you familiar with them? Yes, at a high level, you know, obviously Mr. Beast, uh, they have a talent agency around that. They're also doing, you know, incubations and ventures. Yeah. So I learned about them because they hired us for one of their studio projects. So they needed a product design team to build out one of their products. And I started learning about it. And I was like, whoa, this is brilliant. The brilliance is that they do management of some of the top YouTube creators. And through that, they develop these relationships. And then through that, they're like, hey, let's go incubate some stuff with you. Hey, Mr. Beast, let's go build Feastables. It's this natural relationship. And it really changes the traditional relationship of a manager. When you think of a manager, a creator manager or an artist manager, it's really like they're managing your career and they're making sure you don't make wrong decisions. But this is taking it to the next level. It's like, oh, hey, let's, what are businesses we can build that are huge, huge businesses? Um, so I, I like what I'm seeing there. I'm curious to go deeper on you personally and how you're thinking about 2023, because um, you know, we've been talking about how to go from zero to one. Now I'm curious how you go from 10 to 100 or 100 to 1,000, et cetera. How are you thinking about, maybe we'll start with like on the incubation and, and or acquisition side, what, what types of things are, are you exploring that, that could make sense for you uh, to kind of take it to that next level? So on the agency side, we started off with a design agency that focuses on supercharging community. It's doing really well. It grew in 2022 when it was a difficult year. It's going to grow in 2023. But what are other services that we can offer our clients? So it's basically the game of like, okay, we bill you $500,000 a year. How do we bill you $1.5 million in 2023? And it's honestly just asking some of our clients like, hey, what, like, what, what could we do for you that we're currently not doing? And a lot of us have told us like, oh, hey, like, if only you did like growth marketing, we would pay you for it. Instead, we have to use other agencies. And the interesting thing is some of these bigger clients, like we work with a ton of Fortune 100s, like they don't want to work with a bunch of mini agencies. They want to work with 
one agency that does a lot of things. So expanding our service offering, acquiring agencies, so building a family of agencies, which which can go in, you know, what we talked about in the beginning, it's just easier to, if you have a team that's already proven, why not just go and acquire it and figure out what is the, what is the deal that you can do? We're really interested in creators. So incubating businesses with creators, why are we interested in that? Because, you know, at the core of every creator is a community and that's what we understand. So I think that, you know, building out some products in that space is really interesting and then continue to invest, you know, startup invest and, you know, re reinvest some of that cash flow for compounding. Yeah. It, it's interesting. So going back to our conversation about Lenny, when he's got 10,000 writers, as I, I mentioned to you, you know, I'm looking to build these um, kind of different media properties fo focused around different verticals, um, different, different positions. And I'm finding people who've got, you know, 5,000, 10,000, you know, uh, newsletter writers are doing it on the side and I'm, I'm figuring out what the, what the like best, you know, way to collaborate with them is, do I just, you know, buy them outright, give them a salary, um, and some equity in the new co, but then they have less ownership than they would if I said like buy a portion of it, you know, and th they have a majority ownership or, or half ownership. Like, I know it depends on the, on the person, but maybe give a little bit of advice. And, and similarly, like I have a, one of my best friends runs a growth agency and I don't know what the right way to, to, to work with them in a way that like makes sense for, for, for both of us. Any advice for, for creating kind of like these win-win, win-win agreements among people who want to work together and just figuring out how, how, how to make it make sense? Can you give me a hypothetical, I'm not saying your friend, but like someone who like, give me like what their revenue is, how many people are they, how long have they doing it? I'll give you, I'll give you two scenarios. So I'll give you, I found the, the Lenny of consumer. He's 24. He's been doing this on the side while working on a startup. He wants to go full, full time on it. Um, he, he's not, he's got 10,000, um, subscribers, uh, no one's paying yet. Um, it's really good stuff. Um, like, like, like Lenny, it's like timeless stuff. Um, you know, pro, pro, detailed and out deep dives. Um, and that, that, okay. That's one. The other, uh, my buddy runs a growth agency. My guess is he makes like somewhere between 200 and 300 K a year. Yeah. I think the way I always look at structuring these things is like, how do you make it a win-win? So like with your growth agency friend, I think he is losing his, a little bit of agency if he comes and does this. Um, but he also doesn't have to be in the hunt for new clients. He's got more of a stable paycheck. So I think the question is like, how does, how do you get him to like making close to 250 or something, but also you want to, you want him to be hungry and excited. So with that, I would be like, okay, I'm going to give you equity in this new hold co. Um, you're going to be making 50 to 80% of what you're usually making, but you're getting this upside and here's my commitments to you. And then you, you, you write out your commitments. Like I will, tw you know, tweet out about this. I will speak to this person about it. I will put, I will find $1 million of financing and you'd be surprised like how receptive founders are to that because it's such a lonely path. And a lot of these people have been doing it for a while. And like, especially in the agency land, like a lot of people are stuck at that. Like I make 200 to 300 grand for a very long time. I think the sell to him is also that you're going to be making cash flow, but with, with these studio projects out of PhDs, they could become hundred million dollar, 200 million, $500 million exits. Like it could be a morning brew, you know, you just don't know yet. Um, so I think that if you can position it as like, this could also be really big. Um, so that's my thought on growth agency guy on Lenny 2.0 consumer Lenny. I think, um, I mean, what do you think his motivation is? Like, yeah, what are his, what is his goals? Lenny is actually his career goal. He, he wants to be like Lenny um, in the sense of he wants to be a, you know, respected writer, but also like investor as well. Has he, does he have a pedigree? Like he spent two years, uh, like product at a series A startup. So not, not like Lenny pedigree, but, um, you know, he's a talented guy.
it, that's a t- that's a tougher sell, to be honest. It's a tougher sell because Lenny has paved the path around like here's the things you've got to do. Maybe the closer analogy is like Turner Novak, who, who, as far as I know, didn't have a huge operating background, but is just really smart and and has detailed insight, you know, deep insights on consumer stuff or investing stuff, and and just a great guy. I think the pitch to him, this person is like a mentorship pitch. And it's like, yes, could you do this alone? Yeah, 100%. But could you do it two to five X faster with me with like me coaching it and my network to coach you on this? Like, absolutely. So I think like, you know, if you can take some meaningful amount of equity, and I'm not sure what that is, like anywhere between 30 and 70%, depending on the deal. I think that could be exciting to him um, because if he's trying to be Lenny or he's trying to be Turner, like, you know, Lenny and Turner, I think, have been writing for, for many, many years. Like, it, it does take time. You, you have to put in your reps and granted, like, you will hit those, like, you know, I had a tweet in 2020, which got like 60,000 likes and I got 70,000 followers from it, you know, I think you have those moments as a creator, but the tough part is you're not sure if it's going to be on day 30 or day 3000. So if you can help, and I think that's what you like, if you were doing this, I think what you would bring to the table is, Hey, I'm basically like YC. Um, What does YC do? It accelerates your startup experience. So if you can actually do that, then it's worth paying, you know, the percentage that YC takes. Yeah, and I also want to give him a scout fund to help, you know, which I that, I think that is a unique value add to to get started um, on his investing track. That's really helpful. Gearing towards towards closing here, I'm curious how you're thinking about audience building for yourself in 2023 because I'm asking myself the same question of like, what's the 10x opportunity I, I can pursue? Is is it for you? Is it pursuing one of these newer platforms or just doubling down to your bread and butter? Like, how do you think about that? On writing, I have a newsletter. Um, I basically write when I have a lot of free time. Like the last time I wrote, I was like on a train from Montreal to Toronto. I have five hours. Like I had time to kill. The Wi-Fi was really spotty. You know, that's when I was writing. I would always be like, I have nothing else to do. I'm going to go write. What does that mean? That means I would, this post would come out every six to nine weeks, which is not good for the reader. It's not consistent. 2023 on my newsletter, on my Substack, I'm sending out a post every single week which I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I've got some, a few posts in the bank, so it's happening. Um, so that's cool. The second thing I'm doing is podcasting. You know, why am I doing podcasting? Because it builds affinity with your top of the funnel. So you bring people in through TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, or LinkedIn, whatever you choose, but they get to know you through the podcast. When someone's listening to you for 60 minutes, like you've listened to me, let's say for 50 minutes, whoever's listening to this, like hopefully I've built some amount of trust with you. I'm, I mean, a lot of, some people might disagree with what I'm saying and I, and I totally understand that, but some amount of people will feel that I've built some amount of trust. So I want to double down on my podcast. It's the Where It Happens podcast. Go check it out. And do that and then short form video the beauty about podcasting is you can chop it up and create short form video clips that's the first beauty the second beauty is now with all these platforms that are positive to short form video you can take that short form video and you can put it on youtube shorts you can put it on tiktok you can put it on twitter you can put it on linkedin it's never been a more valuable time to start a podcast because of that reason that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like every other day I'm texting you screenshots of me listening to your podcast. Like it's, it's been fantastic stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll close with that. This has been a masterclass on building an audience, on PHCs, on where communities are going. I highly recommend listening to Greg's podcast, Where It Happens, as well as you know reading Greg's newsletter and, and, and Twitter. I've learned a lot from it. In some ways, the Greg Eisenberg for X is the inspiration for the, for the, for the media company in terms of finding all the, all the potential Greg Eisenbergs out there. Uh, Thanks so much for for coming on the podcast, Greg. Thanks for having me, man. It's been fun. Riverside is a presenting sponsor of Media Empires. It's an essential part of our tech stack. Riverside makes scaling a media business possible for us and so many podcasters and creators. It's our online recording studio. 
not just for the show, but across the entire podcast network. Riverside lets us record interviews with the best guests from wherever they are in the world. Our team can also cut short form clips directly from Riverside. Because as any listener of this show knows, you create once and then publish everywhere. Sign up for Riverside.fm today by following the link in the description box and use our code MEDIAEMPIRES to get a 20% discount.